Okay, um, we're going to get started. Getting some audio through here. Okay. So, uh, first, I'd like to welcome you to this special uh, public lecture uh, run by Astro McGill. Um, my name is Jordan Maraca. I'm a research associate here in the McGill Department of Physics and the McGill Space Institute, and um, I'll be your moderator tonight. So, um, if you're not aware of these events during the school year, um, Astro McGill generally puts on one lecture like this uh, every month or so. Uh, usually on Thursdays. So if this is your first time with us um, and you don't want to miss out on future events, I'd encourage you to follow Astro McGill and or the McGill Space Institute um, on Instagram or Twitter uh, or Facebook. Um, and so that'll also ensure that you don't miss out on special events like tonight's that don't fall um, into the usual schedule. So um, the plan for tonight is to have about a 45 minute talk uh, followed by questions uh, from the audience. So we're live streaming this on YouTube. Um, as well, so you know we'll we'll gather questions from there in the comments, as well as questions from you uh, in the audience here. Um, so as always, um, outreach events run through Astro McGill and the MSI are meant to be inclusive and safe spaces. Uh, you can find our code of conduct uh, on either of those uh, websites, and um, I'd encourage you to get in touch with us if you have any uh, comments or concerns about these events. So now I'd like to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Patrick Bricey. So Patrick earned his PhD at the Johns Hopkins University in the US in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and after he graduated, he actually moved to Canada. He took uh, a postdoctoral fellowship at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, CETA, uh, which is in Toronto. Um, so he's no stranger to Canada. He's no stranger to McGill. Uh, he's visited us before to give seminars and he's in town this week for a workshop happening on the other side of campus. And it was nice enough to agree to give this talk for us as well. So we're very grateful uh, for you, uh, to you for doing this. Um, and in 2020, um, after Patrick finished his fellowship at CETA, he moved to NYU, uh, where he's a James MacArthur postdoctoral fellow at the NYU Center for Particle um, Astrophysics and Cosmology. So as you'll hear about tonight, Patrick is an expert in galaxy evolution across cosmic history. He specializes in particular in this very exciting new technique called intensity mapping, which I'll say a little bit more about tonight, um, and using in particular the very long wavelength emission of galaxies, even longer than the wavelengths being probed by, probed by James Webb, um, as of very recently, uh, to learn about galaxy formation and evolution across cosmic time. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Patrick, and uh, thanks again for being here. All right. Thank you, Jordan, for the introduction, and thanks to all the folks at the McGill Space Institute for the invitation to come talk. And thanks to all of you for coming to listen to me ramble about some hopefully cool space stuff for a bit. Um, for anybody listening on the live stream, um, I will be talking to project to the room. I apologize if my microphone is weird, but you know, this is how we live these days. Um, so what I thought I'd talk about tonight is kind of one of the last really unexplored periods of cosmic history. So my focus as an astronomer is that I'm a cosmologist. And cosmologists you can think of as kind of an astro historian. Our goal is to study the kind of grand sweeping story of the history of the cosmos. We're not necessarily interested in any individual star or planet or galaxy. We wanna know the whole story from the Big Bang to the present day of how the universe formed and grew to be what it is today. And this period called Cosmic Dawn is, if the Big Bang was the beginning of the universe, Cosmic Dawn is really where the universe as we know it today appeared for the first time. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Cosmic Dawn is and how we're using new telescopes and really new, fundamentally new ways of doing astronomy to try and see Cosmic Dawn for the first time. So our entire concept of space as human beings is very heavily centered around these things we call stars. All of these big points of light you see up in the sky when you look out at night. Maybe you have to go a little bit out of downtown in a city like Montreal to see something this good. But when you look up into the sky at night, almost all the lights you see are stars. The moon obviously is immediately recognizable and some of the brighter dots you see might happen to be planets. This particular picture has Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter lined up very nicely for it. 
but everything else you see is a star. Even the Milky Way, this kind of broad cloud slashing across the sky, which if you go pretty much anywhere north of here in Canada, you can see very clearly, is really just the light of thousands and millions of stars that are so close to each other that you can't tell them apart. And even the planets and the moon are really kind of the exception that proves the rule because planets and the moon don't shine by any light of their own, at least not any light that we can see. When you look at the moon or you look at these planets, you're seeing reflected starlight, specifically light from our nearest star, which we give a special name, the sun. And so it's not just, it's not even just looking up in space, though, it's our entire conception of the concept of space. Like if we as a society are telling a story about a bunch of people having a big fight in space, we call that Star Wars. If we're talking about another group of people going on, you know, cool adventures in space, we call that Star Trek. It's even in all of the words we use, starship. Like it's just fundamental to how we talk about space. So it's kind of weird, at least to me, to imagine the point in the history of the universe where stars just straight up didn't exist. <laughs> Uh, the universe didn't look like this. The universe didn't, you know, if you looked up, if any planets existed to stand on, you wouldn't look up and see these stars. You wouldn't look up and see the Milky Way. It looks more or less like this. If you existed, it would just be infinite inky blackness as far as the eye can see. In the room, you can't even see the edge of my slide because it's just blackness. This period of this, this dark age, lasted about 300 million years, we think. At 300 million years, the universe is 14 billion years old. So that's not that long on the scale of the universe. But when you think about it on human scales, the dinosaurs existed 65 million years ago when they wiped out. 300 million years is an incredible amount of time for just this bleak darkness to have existed. And this event we call Cosmic Dawn is when this period of darkness came really rather suddenly to an end all at once with the birth of the very first stars in the universe. So if I want to really talk about what cosmic dawn is then, we really have to dig a little bit into the question of what exactly is a star. And so now that I've you know, sucked you all in here with my talk about you know, sweeping cosmic history stories and beautiful pictures of space, we're gonna talk about chemistry. I'm sure is exactly what everybody wanted to do on their Tuesday evening. The good news is, for anybody having, you know, traumatic flashbacks like I do, that high school chemistry class, for astronomers, it's a much easier periodic table than this. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Stuff that makes your voice squeaky when you breathe it in. It was actually identified in the sun before we found it on Earth. That's why the name is helium for the Greek helios. And all the rest of this stuff, we just call that metals. Doesn't matter what it is. Oxygen, nitrogen in the air, it's a metal. Carbon, it's a metal. And the reason why we can get away with that is that if you actually look at what makes up the matter in the universe, about 75% of it is hydrogen. Of the rest of it, 24% of it is helium. And those metals, all of that other stuff on the periodic table, that's just 2% of the material in the universe. And so, you know, most of the time when we're doing math, we're kind of astronomers. You know, we're not doing like precision nanoscale engineering here. Being 8% right is usually pretty good enough. In fact, for a lot of stuff, we don't even want to look at the We just kind of do everything like it's hydrogen. Um, So a lot of astronomy basically comes down to the dynamics of hydrogen gas on a very simple level. Hydrogen atoms floating around in space. You know, every once in a while they're just kind of bopping around as they do. Every once in a while they come close together, and what usually happens is they just kind of bounce off. You know, a hydrogen atom is a proton and electron. The electrons on the outside of the same electric charge, and so when you bring them close together, the force repels, just like you're putting two of the same magnet next to each other. Even if you take the electrons off and just have the two protons, those are both now positively charged. And those will also, if you bring them close together, just kind of bounce off. What if we let them bounce around freely? What if we take some hydrogen and we force them together? We had exert a bunch of pressure and squish these atoms as close together as we can. It's like 
antagonists in a romantic comedy, they'll resist each other and they'll resist each other until eventually the pressure looks great enough. They decide, oh, actually we're best friends, we're in love. And they actually fuse together and make a helium atom. For any of the experts in the room, it technically takes four hydrogen atoms to make a helium atom, but the picture is good enough for our purposes. Um, now, something really odd happens during this fusion process. And that is if you take a helium atom and you take the hydrogen atoms that went into it and you weigh them on a magic scale that can weigh individual atoms, you'll find that the helium atom weighs a little bit less than the hydrogen atoms that went into it, which is kind of weird. I mean, these are atoms, they're protons and neutrons and electrons. There's not exactly like, you know, I can't like take a proton out of my hydrogen atom. I asked you, what's one plus one? And you said, oh, it's two. And I go, no, it's not two. What are you talking about? It's 1.9. Something is just kind of gone from this process. When I do this fusion, something disappears. And to see what that is, we got to go back to this guy, extremely dignified, famous physicist, Sir Albert Einstein. And one actual physics equation that anybody who doesn't have a physics degree usually remembers, the famous E equals MC squared. So if I take E equals MC squared and can do it for kind of plain what it really says is that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squares, which for our purposes just means energy equals mass times a really big number. And what that means is that this pretty small amount of mass difference between my hydrogens and my new helium, multiply that by a really big number, that gives me, at least by atom standards, a huge amount of energy. How much energy? Well, ow, wow, there was a sound effect there and it just came out in my headphones. <laughs> uh, so much energy that the main use humans have found for this process is taking large amounts of something that we don't want to exist anymore and vaporizing it. Um, this is why we call the biggest nuclear bombs hydrogen bombs because they're powered by this process of hydrogen fusion. We hope, and a lot of people are working on slightly less destructive uses of this process in nuclear reactors, um, which is very hard because it takes, as we said, it takes a lot of force and a lot of pressure to squeeze those hydrogen atoms close enough together to make friends. But I'm supposed to be talking about stars here. And so when I say, what is a star? A star is, in a very real sense, a continuous nuclear explosion going off in space. See, the sun is big. Wikipedia citation needed appears over my head. And all of the mass of all of that incandescent gas that makes up the sun is constantly pressing down on the innermost layers. And right at the core of the sun, that pressure and that heat becomes intense enough that hydrogen atoms finally stop bouncing off of each other and start fusing to make helium. And even though that energy difference from individual atoms isn't that big, when you take as much hydrogen as there is in the sun and start fusing it, you get all of the energy we see coming out of the sun. Now, when I talk about, you know, again, this mass difference for an individual fusion event, atoms don't weigh that much. It can never be that big. But when you actually look at how much mass is being converted into energy in the sun, it's 400, there's 4 million tons every second. Now, 4 million tons is already one of those astronomy numbers that's kind of too big for your brain. So nobody really knows what, can't really picture what 4 million tons is. In the human context, that's a little less than a great pyramid every second out of the core of the sun just disappearing and being converted into heat and light. And that energy radiates out of the core and that's what makes the sun kind of boil and flare as you see in pictures like this. That energy streaming through space is what lights up our planet, what keeps us warm, what keeps us from freezing to death in the endless cold vacuum of space. Um, it provides energy to the crops we eat and the crops that the animals we eat eat. This, you know, our entire existence is owed to this fusion reaction happening in the sun constantly. And the process doesn't stop with hydrogen. See, you know, the sun only has, yeah, the sun is really big, but it still only has so much hydrogen in that middle part. And only the middle part can actually do this fusion. And so it happens when the sun eventually runs out of hydrogen, which will happen in about 5 billion years, is that pressure will increase and it'll start fusing those newly made helium atoms into heavier elements, into our metals. Um, the sun particularly won't, in particular won't go much past carbon. It doesn't have enough mass to squish carbon atoms together. 
But in bigger stars, the process will continue. If it runs out of helium, it'll start fusing carbon and start fusing heavier and heavier elements together to make more and more heavy metal. And then, in a picture which people following astronomy news may recognize, when those stars die, they take all those newly created metals, all that helium and all that oxygen and carbon and everything else, and they spread it out into space. Some stars, stars like our sun, will die like this. So this is a picture from the new launch James Webb Space Telescope, which I'll talk about a little more later. What we're looking at is at the very center of this is a dying star. There's actually two stars JWST figured out the center, but one of them is dying. Um, a trick for James Webb Space Telescope pictures, anything you see that has these eight spikes coming off of it is a star. That's what happens when you have a bright nearby object in a telescope this fancy, the kind of geometry of the mirrors imprints these spiky things on it. So if you see spiky things in a picture, it's probably a star. And this particular star has reached the end of its life and it's kind of puffing off all of its outer layers out into space. And those outer layers contain all of those new metals that the star made. And so all of this red and blue stuff is that gas, it's the atmosphere of the star just kind of drifting off into space. Bigger stars that make heavier elements do something similar but they kind of tear themselves apart in a single violent explosion instead of kind of gently puffing themselves off into space. And then there's newly created metals, all of this gas drifting off into space. That gas collects under its own gravity into dense clouds. This is another James Webb Space Telescope image. And eventually those clouds, which now have the new metals made by the stars in them, they collapse under their own gravity to form new stars. And some of those stars, some of that leftover gas collapses to form planets. And so this particular image, which is a fantastic desktop wallpaper, if anybody's looking for a new one, is showing the opposite of this picture. This is showing, instead of a star blowing gas out into space, this is gas coalescing to form new stars. All of this orange stuff down at the bottom here is dense clouds of gas and dust that is actively forming new stars. And above in the blue area, that's where some of those bright stars we're seeing, some of these newly born stars, the light from those stars is kind of burning off this fog out into space and leaving the new stars floating off into space, off by themselves, possibly with their own planets around them. So our sun formed about five billion years ago and something very much like this. Let's leave that picture up to give the ooh and ah, but it's really pretty. This, this process of forming metals, I said a bunch at the beginning about how I made a big hay about how astronomers don't really care about metals. If you're a human though, you do really care about metals. You know, you do is not hydrogen or helium, it's oxygen. Our bodies, and most of the chemistry we run on, runs on carbon. The atmosphere, but again, the thing about we don't want to freeze to death in the vacuum of space, is mostly made of nitrogen. And if you like living in an industrial human society, you probably use a lot of iron, which you need really big stars to make. So this process of forming and enriching the universe with metals is critical to the fact that we exist at all, that we have a nice planet with nice, nice lecture halls and astrophysicists who can you know, learn about how all this works. So if we look at nearby stars in our galaxy, stars that formed around the same time as the sun, like I said, those stars are about 2% metals. But we know, I've been saying this whole time, that metals are formed in stars. And so that means that there's metals have to come from And so if we look out towards the outskirts of the Milky Way, we can see a different population of stars. Stars that actually have many, much less metals. There's 0.1% or less metals. And what these stars, this is an older population of stars that have not yet, you know, stars that haven't been formed from gas that had quite as many metals in them. Uh, one of the things of this talk, oh yeah, I forgot my stick figure family. I can't gloss over the stick figure family. So these stars are in a very real sense the, the parents' generation to the stars like our sun. This previous generation of stars had to form and increase the metal content of the universe up to the 2% we see in our sun so that we have enough metals to make things like Earth. Uh, one of the things of the talk is going to be astronomers are 
kind of annoying about naming things. So these two groups of stars, one of them is called population one, and one of them is called population two. You probably guess that population one is the one that came first, but it's not. Population one is the one that was discovered first. So these very young stars with all the metals, they look called population one stars. And these older stars with fewer metals, these are the ones we call population two stars. But there's still a problem with this picture. There's a whole other branch of cosmology that I work in dedicated to studying the Big Bang and the birth of the universe. And one of the things we learned from that is the Big Bang can't even make enough metals to make these population two stars, even that's too much. And that means that something else had to make those metals. And the thing we know that makes metals is, of course, stars. So that means that we can infer the existence of grandparent stars in our stick figure family of stars. And of course, very creatively, we call these stars that are older than population one stars or population two, we call them population three stars. You get used to this a lot where we name things before we understand what we are and then we're stuck with the consequences of that for all eternity. So these population three stars are the stars we think form in this event we call cosmic dawn. And so these stars are the stars that made the first metals that then made population two stars, that made population two stars, and then made population one stars, and eventually made us. So this cosmic dawn event, this birth of the first stars, is the beginning of this process that led to our very existence. So as I mentioned earlier, before cosmic dawn, the universe was continuing with the theme of uncreating slightly annoying naming, the, part of the, age of darkness, the dark ages. And during this period, you know, while if you took a time machine back, you wouldn't see anything with your mark one human eyeball, there's still stuff happening. During this time, the universe, we basically think of it as one giant cloud of hydrogen gas with some helium in there, but like I said, we ignore the helium a lot of the time. And that gap is steadily collapsing under its own gravity. You know, areas where there's a little bit more gas, suck in the gas around them and become denser and stronger and pull in more and more gas and continue to collapse. And so this computer simulation I'm showing you, the lighter blue areas are areas where more gas is. This is a map of the density, a simulation of the density of this hydrogen gas. They're places where more and more gas is collapsing under its own gravity. And if you let this go, eventually, you start seeing these bright points of light appear. And what those are, are the places where this gravitational collapse has reached the point where the pressure is high enough for nuclear fusion, and we set off the nuclear explosion that is a star. And so this, what happens is, at, during the Dark Ages, these hydrogen clouds collapse and collapse and collapse until they reach the point where they can light stars, and then we have cosmic dust. There we go. Now, is population three stars, the sun as stars go is pretty unremarkable. It's kind of medium sized. There's stars that are bigger, there's stars that are smaller. It's, you know, it's a star. It's, it's pretty cool. We like it. Population three stars, they formed, we think, in these pristine environments with no metals in them to kind of muck up this star formation process. We think these stars are quite a bit bigger, potentially hundreds of times more massive than the sun. And that means. You know, stars have this property where the big stars, they're really bright. They put out a lot of light. And that means they burn through the hydrogen they have in the center much faster. And that means these big stars don't live very long. The sun's gonna live for about 10 billion years. It's about halfway through that. These stars might have only lived for 10 million years or less, which again, big number by human standards, not a big number by astronomy standards. And so if I let this video play a little bit more when we left off, you know, we start with the uh, we start with all of the hydrogen collapsing under its own gravity. We let that run for a minute. We start to see any second now the first stars appearing, and then pretty soon after this, you see that that's that is in this simulation that is those stars dying in massive supernovae and spreading their newly created elements out into the universe to collapse into population three stars. Oh, and look now you get to see all my YouTube. 
And that's not all they do. These stars, these population three stars and their immediate successors are also key to an incredibly important process in cosmic history, the end of cosmic dawn, which we call reionization. Why would you come to an astronomy talk if you can't come away with some cool new big words to impress your friends with? What reionization is, you know, I said the universe at this point is basically a big cloud of hydrogen gas. Hydrogen is a proton and an electron stuck together. Proton and electron have opposite charge. So just like two opposite magnets, they really like to stick together. Unless, of course, you put a giant star right next to them, blasting tons and tons of light at them. And then you can knock that electron right off. And so a hydrogen atom without an electron is positively charged. We call that an ion. So reionization is the process by which the most of the hydrogen in the universe became ions. And what that means, if we watch another simulation, is that as these stars form, they slowly blow bubbles of ionized hydrogen into this kind of fog of gas that's filling the universe. And so what we're seeing here is another computer simulation. All of the black areas are neutral hydrogen. It's this hydrogen fog that's been filling the universe since shortly after the Big Bang. And all the blue areas are places where these first stars are blasting out of their light and they're blasting the electrons off all of the hydrogen atoms. The simulation is a cube. It doesn't mean the universe is a cube, it just means cubes are easy things to put in your computer. Um, so if we watch, you know, eventually these bubbles grow bigger and they merge and more and more of this, um, this neutral hydrogen starts to disappear until we're left with just brilliant stars and galaxies floating in space which is now much closer to the image of the universe you're used to having in your head. So this process from the end of the dark ages through cosmic dawn and through ionization is where the universe as we know it really appears for the first time. I call reionization, one of the ways I like to think of it is the last great phase transition the universe went through. It's another, another fancy word for you. Um, again, thinking back to high school chemistry, on Earth we talk about phase transitions like ice cubes melting or ice cubes melting into water or water boiling into steam. It's a process where the entire properties of an object change into something totally different all at once. There's a few of these phase transitions in the history of the early universe where the universe changed all at once. Um, we call that process reionization because there was an earlier process when the universe was cooling off when hydrogen atoms and when protons and electrons made friends for the first time and formed hydrogen atoms. Um, so the reionization is them splitting off again rather than splitting off for the first time. So this process where we go from dark clouds of hydrogen to the first stars to burning off that fog, we call that process a phase transition because the whole universe changed state all at once. And that's, I mean, people have technical arguments, but to my mind, that's really the last time that happened in cosmic history before we got to the point where we are today. And so, you know, we have this picture we've built up of the history of the universe with time going from left to right. So we're sitting over here at the present day, way back at the beginning, we have the Big Bang. I don't actually know what that is. When we probably ask, I have no idea what the Big Bang is, nobody does. And then the universe was really hot for a while and then it cooled off and we've settled into this dark age. That lasts for a while and these clouds of hydrogen collapse. And then all of a sudden the first stars light up in cosmic dawn we burn off all of that gas, we blow big bubbles and burn off all of that gas, and we settle into this expanding population of galaxies and stars and planets where we live today. Now, you may notice for all this time I've been sitting here talking, I haven't actually shown you any pictures of cosmic dawn. I've shown you pictures of like star forming regions in our galaxy. I haven't actually shown you any pretty pictures of the topic I'm actually talking about. And that's like half the purpose of being an astronomer is having pretty pictures to show people. Because we don't have any. Now, you might think, well, this happened billions of years ago. Of course, you don't have any pictures. You would need some kind of time machine to go back and actually take a picture of it. And that's not actually the hard part. You know, this randomization and cosmic dawn process, we actually do have time machines that we can go use to see it. We just call them telescopes. And that's because anything, anytime, anything we look at with light, which is what telescopes use. Light travels at a constant speed. We creatively call it the speed of light. And that means that light doesn't get used continuously from one spot to another. So whenever I look at anything, even using my little human eyeballs, not fancy telescopes, you're looking a little bit back in time. 
I'm seeing all of you over here about a couple of nanoseconds in the past. The good part about a second to get to the moon, every time you get to the moon, you were looking a second back in time. So if I take my telescope and I look billions and billions of light years away, I can look billions and billions of years back in time. Okay, so I should go to take, you know, one telescope. That's actually me looking at a solar eclipse. Just point my telescope really far away, and I should be able to look far enough back in time to see if I'm on, right? Well, that doesn't work, and you might be able to guess. There's, there's, there's a highly technical reason why that doesn't work. And that's because, you know, far away stuff is really hard to see. <laughs> So if we want to actually see cosmic dawn, we want to look far enough back in time, we need to get a little bit clever about it. So if we actually want to see the first stars, if we actually want to watch this ionization process unfold, there's a few different tricks we're working on. And none of them have quite gotten there yet, but we are excitingly close. And we may see cosmic dawn for the first time in the next few years. First way is just use a really nice telescope. And if you're kind of the person who's going to be coming to an astronomy talk, you may have heard uh, last week that we just got a really nice new telescope. Um, last Christmas, um, we finally, after many years of delays, launched the James Webb Space Telescope out into space. And um, last week, we got the first images down off of it. Uh, we saw a couple of them earlier with the dying star and the star, stars forming. And, you know, you could take really good pictures of stuff relatively nearby things. But with a telescope this good, you can also look much farther away. You can see fainter things. And so, you know, we can point our telescope really far away and we can see entire other galaxies in exclusive detail, better detail than we've ever been able to before. We got some stars. You can see the little spikes coming off of them. And all these heavy things, these are galaxies. They are extremely far away compared to anything in the Milky Way, but they're relatively close as galaxies go. Each one of these things, its own independent blob of potentially hundreds of billions of stars. They all might have planets, they might have, who knows, they might even have life. This is, you know, the scale of the universe is truly ridiculous and the level of detail we can see is incredible. And with the tricks from the James Webb Space Telescope, we can look into longer frequencies than our eyes can see. And one of the things you can see there is places like this kind of red smear in between these galaxies. And that is a place where these galaxies are colliding and the gas has gotten dense enough that there are new stars being born. So that is actually like that star forming region I've, we saw earlier, but much, much further away. You kind of can't avoid basically any picture you take with it. You see tons and tons of really, really far away galaxies. So basically every dot in this picture that doesn't have the full spikes coming off of it is a galaxy. It's a system of stars, potentially every big as big as the Milky Way or these ones in the foreground, but even farther away. And, you know, the way telescopes work, if you want to see fainter and fainter things, you basically look for longer, kind of like a long exposure photograph of your phone if you're taking a night mode picture. So JWST has been out there long enough to really dive deep and kind of break records for the farthest galaxy yet, so we don't think it has. Um, but it will very quickly, you know, Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, would have taken like much more time to take a picture this sort of thing. So as it goes, James will very, very quickly set records for the farthest galaxies ever. And people are pretty sure it's going to be able to see galaxies consisting of these population three stars for the first time in the next few years. But, you know, even James Webb, even our really best telescopes aren't the best we can do. What I think we can do is we can take those galaxies we're looking at, those relatively nearby ones, we can use those as telescopes in their own right. What do you mean by that? So telescopes you can think of as basically light buckets. You take a big lens or a big mirror, you take all the light hitting that, and you focus it down either into your eye or into a camera. So you get a lot of light in a small space, and that lets you see really faint things. So a big part of it tells you how good a telescope is, is how big its mirror or its lens is. We can do, but we can potentially do better by using the galaxy through a process we call gravitational lensing. If it's got big lens in the slide, it can make really can't touch the lens A backyard telescope like mine might have, you know, 20 centimeters a foot, maybe if you've got a big one. The biggest mirror we've put in space 
is about a six and a half meter mirror. It's about three times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope. And we actually had to fold it up to fit a mirror that big into a rocket because we couldn't fit it up um, unfolded. On the ground, if we don't have to you know, spend the money to put a mirror up into space, we're building telescopes like the imaginatively known 30 meter telescope, which you might guess has a mirror that's 30 meters across. Bigger mirrors are better. Um, space telescopes get a little bit of a pass because the atmosphere is annoying. But if you want to know how good a telescope is, a zero authority, just ask how, how big it's mirror is. So by the gravitational lensing process, let's say make use of structures that are, I always remember, a one followed by a lot of zeros meters across. And the way it works is I pick some galaxies that are nearby. I go find the most massive cluster of galaxies that I can. And what happens is the gravity from all of those galaxies will take any light that's coming from behind them and it will be bend to the light. And if things are lined up right, that light will be bent and focused down and towards us on Earth, just like a lens or a mirror on your telescope focuses light onto your camera. And so we can use this we can use this coincidental alignment of close by galaxies and far away galaxies to make those far away galaxies a lot brighter and easier to see. And so now we have the last of the four JWST pictures that came out last week. One of the first things they did is they look, for, look at exactly this gravitational angle. In the middle of this picture, you see some fuzzy white galaxies. Those are the foreground galaxy cluster. That is a cluster of really big, massive galaxies relatively close to us in astronomical terms. Away from all of the pretty spiky stars, you see these kind of weird stretched out patterns that are kind of vaguely making circular patterns around the middle of that. These are galaxies that have been gravitationally lensed, like this foreground cluster is like a big fisheye lens, magnifying all the stuff behind them. Now, they get all kind of stretched out and weird, but they also get a lot brighter and a lot bigger than they would otherwise be. And so it's, you can see these really far away, comparatively faint galaxies in much greater detail than you ever could if you, you know, were just trying to see them individually way up over here somewhere. So this gravitational lensing technique is another really powerful tool in our toolbox that especially JWST is going to be able to use to push the boundaries of its observations farther and farther away and farther and farther back in time. The third trick, which Jordan mentioned at the beginning, is near and dear to my heart. And so the thing that I spend all of my time doing is instead, let's go the opposite way. Instead of trying to take really, really good pictures of you know, a couple of galaxies, let's try to see all of the galaxies at once. Is a technique we call intensity mapping. This is what I wrote my PhD thesis about and what I spend all my days thinking about. I said at the beginning of this, the goal of a cosmologist is to understand the whole, the history of the universe as a whole not necessarily to understand individual galaxies. My uh, thesis advisor somewhat derogatorily referred to object-oriented astronomy as the, the, the process of taking really pretty pictures of individual objects. So if I'm looking out in the space, you know, have a really big telescope like James Webb, you know, if I've gotten really lucky and I have a massive galaxy cluster, it's still really expensive. It's a lot of fun with a telescope to see really far away. And even then, you're only going to see the brightest galaxies out there, right? Because the brightest things are the ones we're going to see first. So if they take this as kind of a, a simulation of a group of galaxies way off in the universe, every gray point might be a galaxy. But we spend a ton of time with a really expensive telescope, and there are other people who want to use that telescope to like look for alien life and things like that. I might only see, say, the ones I've marked in red, so like one percent or so of the brightest objects in the universe. And if something is brighter than 99% of everything else, those objects are probably weird. It's like, if I try to figure out how fast humans can run and the only person I look at is Usain Bolt, I'm probably not gonna get an accurate picture of how things work. This intensity mapping idea is to basically say, I don't care about any of these individually, I don't know how they all work. So instead of building a nice telescope, I'm gonna take a really crappy picture of all of these galaxies. And you're gonna get something like you see over here. These kind of, orange blobby looking things. If you look closely, you can see they follow kind of the same pattern of the galaxies over here. And what you're seeing is each one of these blobs is the total light from all of the galaxies in one place. And as you might be able to imagine, it's easier to add up to see the light from a bunch of galaxies at once than it is to pick out any individual thing. 
So we've lost the ability to take nice pictures of individual things and learn how they work. But we can look at the statistics of this entire population. So for example, one of the things that I work on is using a molecule called carbon monoxide to study the total amount of stars that are being born in the universe at any given time. Not just the amount of galaxies of stars being formed in the red dots, but the total amount of stars and trying to basically see if it's different. And we're starting to think it might be. Um, because you don't need to put a $10 billion telescope in space to do this measurement, um, there's a bunch of smaller experiments trying to do this intensity mapping thing. I, uh, oh, what a coincidence, pick two of the ones that I work on here. And um, we have a telescope out in uh, the Owens, out in the desert in California called CEOMAP, um, a telescope being built down in Chile called FIST. You know, there's a really tall person in the middle of this photograph who, you know, is, is, is nobody in particular. Um, and so these telescopes, this, kind of, this, is a, this is a new idea. These are kind of first generation telescopes. So we're pushed, but we're already pushing out into this reionization era. And we think that as we go, we will eventually be able to push all the way out into Cosmic Dawn as we refine this technique further. The last thing I want to talk about, um, since I'm at McGill, and this is something a lot of McGill people work on, is the final trick is going to be a trick I like to refer to as tune into radio hydrogen. We use the hydrogen itself to learn about the history of the universe. Hydrogen atoms, once again, proton and an electron. If I have one of these things floating off into space, up in space, they constantly give off a very faint radio signal. You don't see this on Earth because on Earth, I don't know, they're constantly bouncing off of each other or being stuck together in water molecules. But if they all bounce themselves off in space, there's a faint radio signal that every hydrogen atom goes off. And just like, you know, listening to the radio in your car, we can build a big fancy radio antenna and we can listen for this or look for this. The analogies get a little weird when you start talking about radio. So just like, you know, I tune my radio to 101.9 FM or whatever. That is tuning my radio to listen for a specific frequency of light. I don't know if I would give off this radio emission at a frequency of about one and a half gigahertz or 21 centimeters of wavelength. The distance between the peaks in the radio wave is going to be exactly 21 centimeters. That means that I listen to the frequency, I can go find hydrogen. So in a lot of places, you're not allowed to broadcast radios at this 21 centimeter frequency because we have managed to convince governments that this is really useful for astronomy and they should let us have it. And, you know, they should keep letting us have it and the people who live in a democracy and go. Um, but even better, since the universe is expanding, further and further away, these 21 centimeter long waves gradually get stretched out. The expansion of the universe pulls the crusts of the waves apart from each other as it's pulling all of the galaxies farther and farther away from each other. And that means if we tune our hydrogen radio to lower and lower frequency, we can look farther and farther away. And we can figure out how far away we're looking very precisely, which is one of the hardest things to do in most astronomy is figure out exactly how far away something you're looking at is. And this process only happens when the hydrogen atoms have their electrons on them. The physics that leads to this emission needs both the proton and the electron. But by not the hydrogen atom, the radio emission goes away. You might be able to see where I'm getting at here. We have this ionization process that happens at the end of cosmic dawn, where all of the hydrogen atoms in the universe are losing their electrons. So I look farther and farther away, I'm looking further and further back in time. So I mean, I can see my radio antenna. I can watch the process happen in, if you stretch the analogy a bit, real time. You can actually take a three-dimensional picture of this reionization and cosmic dawn process. And so here at McGill, we have one of the uh, significant contributors over here in the corner. There's an, an experiment called HERA, which is in the middle of nowhere in a desert in Australia, which is listening for these very faint radio signals. It's a very hard measurement to make. Um, there's a lot of other stuff happening at these radio frequencies. Um, one of the reasons why it's in the middle of nowhere, Australia, is that humans also like to broadcast radio emission a lot at these frequencies. And there's also, you know, you might imagine your classic rock station is a little bit louder than like faint whispers from the beginning of time. Um, and even once you get beyond that, things like radio emission from the Milky Way galaxy and stuff are much brighter. It's a very hard problem, but it's one that you're making more and more progress um, towards, towards getting. And at least in principle, Hera can see all the way out to cosmic dawn and even a little way out into the dark ages to watch that. This is, you know, there's nothing else but those dense clouds of hydrogen. If they can get rid of all of these. 
So this whole process that we're trying to see, you know, the birth of these first stars, like I said, this is how we got here today. You know, this is, for me at least, this is why we do astronomy. We're trying to figure out, I just, I want to understand like, why are we here and how did we get here? We don't really understand it. Like we have computer simulations, we have theories, but until we actually see it, we don't know if something weird could be going on. There's some experimental hints that, you know, maybe dark matter is the hydrogenums are bouncing off of dark matter particles. And then there are other experimental hints that those experiments are wrong. And until we actually manage to see these things with our own eyes, or at least our own fancy telescope eyes, we won't really understand we don't really understand this last step in this process of how we got here. The process of how the first stars formed, how they burned off that fog of the early universe, how they produced the metals that eventually formed later stars, which form ourselves and our star and our planet. We are very close. We're not quite there yet, but we're inching very close to being able to see the beginning of this process with our own eyes. Uh, thank you all for being a great audience. Um, that's the end of my talk, and I will happily take questions. I will let uh, Questions for Patrick. Yes, right here. Yeah, so you mentioned at the very beginning the 300 million year until the first star formation. I'm just curious is that a number that comes purely from cosmological theory, or are there any observations by sort of reverse engineering observations that sort of put about? So there is, there is. There's, There's one, one main thing, thing that's actually we've been talking a lot about conference I'm here this week. We have some light from the very beginning of the universe. There's this thing called the cosmic microwave background that was emitted during the electron for the first time. We can't, that streams through all of this and in the process it interacts with things. We can't like separate out individual pieces of it. We have to take the whole thing at once. But that light gets made a little bit fainter by electrons basically. So for the entire time in the universe where there are electrons floating around, the light is being made dimmer. So by seeing how much dimmer the light is, we can see how long this post randomization phase, like we can get an idea of the total amount of time it takes. There's uncertainty on it, but we have a vague idea of when this process starts, started and ended. Um, although some people at this workshop this week think we might be somewhat wrong about that, but we have, we have, we have vague ideas, not totally computer simulations. More questions? Yes. I've been mean, uh, reading in the James Webb Space Telescope stuff for how uh, prior to 400,000 years, the universe was opaque or like completely transparent. 400,000 years after the Big Bang, what caused it? It was just too dense for light to move. It was. So on a foggy day, light passes through the fog, but it's constantly bouncing off of water molecules. So like you can see that it's light out on the, during the daytime in a fog, but you can't actually see anything. And so before this, it's here we call recombination, which is, as I mentioned, when the electrons and the protons connected for the first time, light likes to bounce off of those electrons. So those electrons were essentially fog that the light was constantly bouncing off of. So the big bang was a lot of heat into the universe. So all of that gas was glowing like metal right out of a forge, except much, much hotter. But light couldn't go in a straight line for very long. And so when we say the universe is opaque, that's what we mean. And then for most of this dark age, really um, ultraviolet light couldn't travel either um, because ultraviolet light that can knock electrons off of, proton off of protons would also get eaten by all of that hydrogen. And so it took until this um, dark age, until cosmic dawn for the universe to become fully transparent to um, both the shorter wavelengths of light as well. More questions for Patrick. See if there are any on YouTube. We have one over here. Ah, yes. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> um, I, admire, I admire how much pull you think we have at the World's Conference. <laughs> we, we, spend, we spend all our capital convincing you all the world is flat. Um, uh, part of the problem is 
as with all as with a lot of these observations, um, it takes a lot of time. The observation we're looking for very faint things, and so there's a lot of noise. So basically, you can think of it: every number we're trying to measure essentially has a much bigger random number added to it. So we have to measure for a long time, so all those random numbers kind of average down to zero. So, you know, the COMAP experiment I'm on, for example, um, we think we're going to have to stare at the sky for continuously for basically five years to see what the thing we want to see. Um, and I doubt um, we could convince people to stop using. Actually, no, that's not quite true. I'm forgetting things. There are places um, in the world, there are places where you're not allowed to use radios. Actually, um, I don't know where ones are in Canada, but in the US, there's a place in West Virginia, there's a whole area where you are not allowed to use anything that broadcasts. You can't have cell phones, like there are like trucks driving around because they have a bunch of fancy radio telescopes in the middle that will break if you use a cell phone too close to them. So we can do it in small areas for a long time, which works better than trying to do it everywhere for a short time. Um, I'm kind of curious to know how, what would it look like? Because right now we're living in population one stars. Mm -hmm. Um, what would it look like after like the next step of that? So I guess the right population zero starts. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably exactly what we would call it. <laughs> um, well, they would have higher metallicity. Um, I don't know, like if you're just looking out into space, I don't know if they would look differently by your eyes in order to identify these differences. We kind of have to look at the details. Um, we actually take the light and run it through prisms. One of the things though, that will definitely be is there'll be less of them. The star formation rate in the universe peaked about, I don't know, in here somewhere. Um, and it has been falling off to the present day. Most of the stars being born formed billion, most of the stars that exist formed billions of years ago. Most stars that will ever exist formed billions of years ago. Um, we are kind of close to understanding why that's happening, um, but the trend is pretty clear. The, the rate of star formation in the universe as a whole is declining um, and will likely continue into the future. Um, so less is probably the biggest thing. Okay, so we have a question from YouTube that I'll relate to you now, Go for it. which is, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, what happens to the electrons after reactions? They just kind of float around. Um, every once in a while, we were talking about phase transitions earlier. We have solid, liquid, gas, states, states of matter. There's another one we call plasma, which is like a gas, but we've taken all the electrons off of the protons. And the pro you know, all of the starlight doesn't stop after plasma is gone. All of these stars are constantly emitting these high energy photons out into space. So every once in a while, an uh, electron and a hydrogen and a proton will crash into each other nice enough to, to merge and make a hydrogen atom. But pretty quickly, an ultraviolet photon from one of these galaxies will come around and knock it right back off. So if you go in between galaxies, basically, you see the protons and electrons kind of all over the place. Yeah, so we don't really know. Oh, yeah, so repeating for anybody on Zoom, the question is what is the shape of the universe? And we picture it being more like a sphere, but I've kind of drawn it as a rectangle here. Um, this is not an actual picture of the shape of the universe. This is kind of a cartoon, which is like a timeline, um, more than an actual picture of the universe. We don't really know what shape the actual universe is. Um, it might stop some point, it might not. Um, the observable universe um, looks like a sphere because the observable universe is made up all of the stuff that we can see. And what basically happens is every direction we look, we can look farther and farther away, farther and farther back in time. And we eventually hit that point where the other gentleman mentioned the universe becomes opaque and we see this cosmic microwave background light. And that appears to be a sphere all the way around us. But that's not a intrinsic physical property of the universe. That's just, you know, if I look the same distance away in all directions, that's, that's what a sphere is. Um, so the universe is not shaped like that. Okay. Yeah, I so we have maps. 
Uh, is it worth me Googling a picture of the CMD on Zoom or will I break something important? We have telescopes, the telescopes that see this cosmic microwave background light, this, this light from much earlier than I've been talking about today. We can make a map of that over the entire sky. Every direction you look, you see this light um, about 13.7 billion light years away. Um, we have seen it in every direction. Um, it, is, it is everywhere um, because the Big Bang was the entire universe forming. The Big Bang itself kind of happened everywhere. There's no part of the universe that's really different than any other one. So every direction we look, we see the Big Bang. Um, I mean, I believe it's something like the Big Bang Theory, but the name is terrible. <laughs> The Big Bang Theory, the, the, the actual theory those words describe, is a theory of basically everything in this process except the Big Bang. The Big Bang is the one part of it we don't know. We know something happened, but we don't actually know what it is. Um, oh, sorry, we had, we had something in the front. How significant is that one of the models where you have a bounce? Um, where I have like a previous universe that bounces. Yeah, so it's like, so it doesn't bounce, it's, it's, it's eons. It's divided into eons that first a previous universe existed and the remnants of it should be able to be detected if it currently exists. There are a lot of theorists who think hard about these things. Um, the problem with all of them is, so we've gotten, we've gotten into the talking about the Big Bang part of the cosmology talk, which happens at every one of these because the Big Bang is much cooler than anything else I'm gonna talk about. Um, the problem with any theory like this, any of these cyclical theories, or any theory that tries to explain this part, is that we know our level laws of physics as we know it stop working at some point. Like, all laws of physics only work in certain, all, the, all of our equations only work in certain situations. If I like toss a baseball to one of you, I don't really have to worry about resistance from the air. But if I try to toss a feather to you, that's just gonna kind of float around because the air matters for the feather. We know for a fact that when conditions get hot and dense enough, we know the laws of physics will stop working and we don't know what new ones to use. And that makes it, you know, people think hard about this and try and make predictions of things we could see out here where we know our laws of physics work. But it's very hard to know which ones are true. Because all of our theory, all of our data say there has to have been this, this spot where the laws we know stop working. And so people make guesses, but it's, you know, very smart people are thinking about it. But I would say we don't know enough to say if any particular theory, including this, I think I've heard of this Penrose model. Um, it, we don't really know enough to say. It's more people like Penrose are trying to come up with evidence we can look for out here to describe specific theories. Um, we haven't found any yet. So my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, another thing where we're really bad at words. So the question was, the shape of the universe is describing a spherical, but we also cosmologists like to say the universe is flat. Flat in this context is a very specific geometrical statement that the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. You can define a flat universe in this sense in three dimensions or four dimensions or five or however many. Um, so I can have a universe that exists inside a spherical volume, but the space inside that sphere is flat. Um, <sighs> It's Euclidean. It's Euclidean. Yes, Euclidean geometry. If you want, so if you want the math words, um, flat does not mean like the universe is a rectangle. Flat is a property of geometry within the universe. We just say flat and then cause problems. So we have another question on the side room. Yeah. Uh, population zero and stars. Will that out? <sighs> So this is a something, so we have telescopes, we can look back in time. We don't have anything to look forward in time. So anything I say in the rest of the sentence is going to be pure modeling. It's gonna be pure taking the equations we know and running them forward. And so if there's something we don't know about the universe, like if there's another phase transition at some point that we don't know about, 
where I could just be wrong. What we think is going to happen is the star formation rate is going to continue to decline and eventually stop. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. There is this thing called dark energy that we don't know what it is, and it would be an entire another talk for me to talk about it. It's making the universe expand faster and faster. And so hopefully it's not the last question. This is gonna be kind of a depressing way to end a talk about the beginning of everything. Um, the best models we have, if we run them forward, end in this phase where all of the stars gradually die and their remnants cool off, they form black holes. Even those black holes eventually evaporate um, after 10 followed by like 40 zeros of time. And the universe is back to being cold, infinite blackness as far as we know forever. Um, so yay, cosmology. <laughs> Mapping also oh yes, please ask questions about intensity mapping. <laughs> yeah, so I only described it in the context of this hydrogen signal, this process by which waves get stretched out, but that is actually any of these things that are really far away. The same process is what we use to tell how far away things are. It's a process called redshifting. Um, because the universe is expanding, things farther away are moving faster. And if you hear like a siren coming towards you, the pitch kind of rises and then falls. That is the same <laughs> happening to the light. Um, so if we have a galaxy and we know, like we have something like, there are a lot of features like this where certain atoms or molecules give off specific colors or frequencies of light. So we know the frequency that's being emitted, we look at the frequency that's observed, we can tell how much the universe has expanded since then, and we can tell how far away it is. It's like amongst ourselves, we rarely say like these objects are 10 billion light years away. We usually say the frequency of the light is redshifted by this much because that's the number we actually measure with our telescopes. The JWST, there are some pictures you can see where they take they take the light from these galaxies and they put it through a prism of light. And you can see them moving as they look farther and farther away. Um, and the intensity mapping works on the same principle. We're looking at a molecule. We know what frequency the molecule emits at. We know what frequency we're observing at. And so that tells us what redshift it's at, how far away it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In my case, we're actually looking at carbon monoxide molecules specifically, carbon monoxide molecules specifically yeah. in galaxies. They show up, carbon monoxide shows up wherever stars are being born. Like this, uh, uh, this is gonna be way too many slides to click back. Like, oh my goodness, how many slides do I have? It's a long talk. This was not worth it. This gap, got a lot of carbon monoxide in it. The stuff. And so if we look for carbon monoxide, we can see this gas. Out in the blue part, the starlight knocks the carbon and oxygen molecules away from each other, just like they knock the electrons off the hydrogen. So there's no carbon monoxide out there. So the carbon monoxide is the carbon gas that are forming stars. And even though we can't see it all pretty like this, we can measure the total amount of carbon monoxide, which the total, the total amount of gas tells us the total amount of stars are being born. And then we look at the redshift, and that tells us how far away we're looking. We can look at different redshifts and see, it, see the timeline evolving as we go. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it can be anything. I usually use carbon monoxide. There's other species. Some people use other lines from hydrogen. Some people, some people use this 21 centimeter line, but from galaxies, there's there's a whole alphabet soup. There's a whole alphabet soup of tele There's like 20 different telescopes all doing slightly different things for this intensity mapping thing. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, this is a bit of a meta question, but what's the best way for non PhDs to sort of maybe read up on this and catch up with the the current state of thinking because I, I read a lot of books on this about 20 years ago and i know it's evolved since then but i don't know what are the best sources to... um talks like this happen once a month uh, at the mcgill space institute i really are really good um honestly if there's like if like a astronomy book shows up on like a bestseller list it's probably a pretty decent resource. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson still writes some stuff when he's not being a little bit of a jerk on Twitter. 
Um, I don't know, anybody else have specific suggestions? Podcasts, yeah, there's, there's good podcasts. Um, you know, if you read, like, especially with all of these pictures and the, 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 the space telescope down from computer, then the telescope, they post a really nice breakdown with all of these pictures, and they'll, like, show different frequencies, like, different parts of the picture, and then break down why they're interesting. They'll show some of the spectra, like I was talking about, the two different colors and how you used to tell stuff how far away it is. So if you, like, look at the primary sources for these things, you believe they do a pretty good job of breaking them down. Um, but... Or if you just like follow some astronomers on Twitter, some like PhD astronomers on Twitter and like look at some of the stuff they post, usually people will post some good stuff. But I, I like podcasts. Podcast is a good idea. Okay. Or well, there's, I'm going to butcher the name, Kurgzat. Kurgzat. Yeah. It's just a little, a little. Yeah, it's there's always there's always a game where it's hard to find. Yeah, it's a, a little bit of everything. I don't I don't I don't have a specific. I don't I don't have a silver bullet. So this is a this is a very this is actually a very deep property, like the entire basis of our subject of cosmology. That the answer to that question is, on average, yes. The universe looks if you average basically the same everywhere. Obviously, like if you look on small enough scales, this universe, this this room, is not an average place in the universe. Um, but on average, if you like zoom out over you know scales larger than galaxies, things are basically the same everywhere. And this is actually one of the reasons why, one of the ways we think, one of the things that lead to some of our theories about what's happening just after the Big Bang, because the universe is too big for that to kind of happen without something weird happening at the beginning. Stuff can only talk to each other at the speed of light and something way over there, something way over there. And if light has taken the entire lifetime of the universe to get from here to us, then it can't have gotten over here at all. So at some point the universe, there's this period called inflation, which would be another entire lecture where the universe had to expand faster than light to kind of smooth everything out to be basically the same everywhere. So the answer is yes, we have looked in all the directions and every direction looked basically the same. Because people sometimes, people sometimes think they found an area that looks, that's big enough that looks different. And that is like a major, like problem for the theories. None of them have managed to break the theory yet. None have been big enough, but this is, this, it's called homogeneity, that everything is the same, basically the same everywhere. Um, so, yes. Um, yeah, this is a bit of a two-parter. And I apologize if I misunderstood something. But I don't apologize, it's very complicated. You see the, the dark ages, which mm -hmm. is the, the entire goal of your studies, correct? Less more of the stuff after the dark ages. Um, we don't have stars in the dark ages. So, that but. was kind of leading into my question is um, the only way that you can see that is by using the, the radio waves given off, right? You have to use something that's not stars. And most of what's there is hydrogen. Okay. So these guys with their Hera telescope are looking for these hydrogen radio waves. There's a couple of other fancier forms of hydrogen and maybe some helium that you might also be able to use, but it's a similar idea. You're not seeing individual things like stars anymore. So there would be, would there be any possible way to get, in your own words, a nice pretty picture of that <laughs> era of the universe? That's something else we've been talking about all week. <laughs> Eventually, maybe. <laughs> What basically glossing over a lot of really annoying math, these contaminants, things like emission from the galaxy, they like eat 
part of the picture, basically. Um, it's like if you're listening, we're listening to radio waves, an analogy like you're listening to a like station you can barely hear and you like hear a couple of words jumping in and out of static. You can tell that there's somebody talking, but you can't necessarily pick out the whole sentence they're saying. So we could kind of learn about like the statistical properties of the hydrogen, but we couldn't necessarily make a nice picture of it as we think now. We might be able to work it out. We're working on it um, because every telescope wants to show people pretty pictures. Um, but it's actually incredibly hard to take that picture. So, so I think eventually maybe is a great place to end. <laughs> so let's all thank Patrick again. You have a question? Mm -hmm. And regarding about the age, because you mentioned like um, the hydrogen like gravitates towards like the point where the, uh, the gas tends to be lower. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and I then, this yeah. yeah, so like it can constantly get gravity and that forms the first galaxy. Mm -hmm. But um, like my question is like what keeps the gas constantly gravity towards that 